Okay, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Dr. Jim is here. Finally, finally, we are continuing our series on Aristotle on Aristotle's Nicobachean Ethics. Uh, Book five, um, you might be wondering what happened to book four. What happened to book four? We're going to let Jim explain that. We're actually just going to condense it into into this lesson. Is that right? Yeah, Professor. Yeah, or I'm going to justify why I'm skipping book four. Okay. It's basically why, right? Yeah. yeah go, go ahead. Let's just get right yeah, into it. Yep. So, uh, and this this is this is you know, I'm going to I'm going to give an ad hoc justification for my pedagogical laziness. Is basically what's going on here. Um, so, in our last episode, since which we have chilled, um, we did book three, and basically the the overriding. Uh, argument of book three is to make a case that one can be responsible for their state where the two possible states are virtue or vice or the two most important states are virtue or vice okay that's a puzzle because um aristotle thinks that the greatest threat to voluntary action to responsibility which is a necessary though maybe insufficient condition for, for responsibility the greatest threat to voluntary action is ignorance, but he also defines vice as a state of ignorance. Okay. Yeah. And so in book three, you get a very, what I think is maybe Aristotle's best, like this really interesting argument as to how you could be responsible for your own ignorance. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, in, in typical, you know, Aristotelian fashion, the whole treatise is a bit ad hoc. Okay. So we got back in book two, an introduction to what virtue is in general. Okay. And we found that it was, uh, it's, it's species is, uh, a state, right. And it's genus is a mean state. Okay. And, and then we got introduced to the four, what we call today, the cardinal virtues, although I don't believe the term is used by Aristotle, yeah. um, you know, courage, temperance, justice, and prudence. Okay. Uh, and then we get a timeout to talk about responsibility, which, okay. Why it comes up there. I think there's probably better scholars than I am, than I, who could, who could tell you that, but it's kind of a, kind of get a sidetrack that we get this responsibility, but it does sort of make sense. We got an introduction of virtue and then we get a discussion of, okay. Um, to, and the, the path of virtue is supposed to be the path of the good life. Right. And so it seems that the virtue is something we're called to a kind of action to move toward, mm-hmm. but it, so then it better be up to us in some sense, Right that to become virtuous so, so the the digression to the discussion of voluntary versus involuntary action and virtue sort of makes some sense there okay yes but then he gets back on topic in book four okay and what he does there is as he gave a general introduction a cursory introduction to the four cardinal virtues in um book book two and a little more a little close discussion of courage there too he gives you kind of a more detailed discussion of courage in book in book two Mm -hmm. now in book four we get like a classic aristotelian catalog cursory discussion of Mm -hmm. all the minor virtues yeah okay Mm -hmm. right and so if you look at this um you know you know once again in i don't know if yours includes a a table of contents because once again aristotle didn't write the table of contents but if you look at book four you know we get uh, you know, chapter one is generosity. Chapter two is magnificence, right? Chapter three is greatness of soul. Uh, four, the nameless virtue concerned with with small honors, right? Uh, I mean, don't get too bent out of like like little compliments. <laughs> I love that one actually. All right, um, mild manneredness, uh, nameless virtue being uh, 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 integrating and uh, being disagreeable, truthfulness, wit, shame. Okay, so. Right. Uh, we get we get well actually in some like virtues and vices there. Okay, and once again we go through the minutia of all those. But I, the reason I'm not inclined to do it, and I generally don't do it with my students, is what we're getting there is um, though there's things to learn there, but th- we're getting a snapshot of what are probably really culturally relative things for like fourth century Athens. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And right. and and we're not really learning about the actual structure of the virtuous life that, that we would, we would, we would say, I know you and I would say, isn't culturally relative, but it's sort of transcultural. It's like built into human nature. Yeah. So okay. a, a yeah. sort of a focus on that chapter could actually be maybe deleterious to the greater project in the sense it might cause a little baby going out with the bathwater type of thing. Yeah, I could. I mean, cause I, I think you're going to find things, especially, okay. If you're looking at it from a Christian perspective, right. Um, 
you're going to find things in there, like what he says about like great soldness and things like that, that eh, don't really fit too neatly with Christian charity or humility or things like that. Okay? Right, right. Mm -hmm. now, and, but I'm not saying that, that thereby they should be ignored, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But I think this is something that McIntyre talks about quite a bit is, you know, in After Virtue, his great defense of the Nicomachean ethics, he does not go into any great detail of Aristotle's actual account of the virtues, let alone the minor virtues. Okay? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. he says, look, and this is, I think it's important to understand the Aristotelian view of things, is there is a great deal of cultural relativism built into Aristotle, as much yes. as we hate that word. Okay. But it's a healthy cultural relativism. It's that, you know, think of like, what is virtue for the individual? Well, it's the mean for that individual. Okay. Right. And so it's going to have to be worked out based on your life situation, your, your strengths, your weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Okay. So much of what goes on in virtue is, dare I say, relative to the individual, though not right. subjective. It's yeah. it, there's an objective relativity or relative objectivity, right? Yeah. So there's, there's always going to be like a moral fact of the matter, but it's yeah. going to shift and slide depending on the yeah. context and the individual yeah. and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and, and just, you know, think of it, you know, you know, Pat, is, you know, Hey, Pat's a hard gainer, right? So what should Pat eat? <laughs> Pat should eat everything. In case anybody hasn't his, noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 uh, you know, what should Pat eat? Everything get into his mouth. Right? right. Hey, Jim, Jim is a dispositional recovering fat person. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. So what should Jim do? There's Be a t-shirt idea. <laughs> yeah, there, right. Right. No, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I am fat by disposition and I'm recovering from like achieving that state. Right? Okay. You're, 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 like my body wants to get bigger. So what should I do? I should be very careful what I eat. Okay. So right. like the temperance for, for Pat Flynn is different than temperance for Jim Madden, though this right. overall structure of it is the same. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think Aristotle is going to say something similar about <laughs> like, the polis or civilizations is that what's go like what's going to count for working out some of these virtues in certain cities is going to depend on who we're dealing with, what the prior history is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I yeah. want to say one other thing here that actually relates to a, a point that got brought up in our previous conversation is that um, you always want to be a little careful with this, right? Because it's kind of bold, but you can also just um, fault the master for failing to be inconsistent. Right. Or failing to yeah. be consistent. Sorry. Sure. Where, where like, Hey, your system, your structure is right, but you actually just got this fact wrong. Right. Yeah. And we were talking about the elements before with Aquinas and, and material things. And I think certainly for Aristotle, when we're thinking about the sort of celestial spheres, like giving them a sort of celestial matter and thinking that, um, they don't need to be caused, I think is a failure of Aristotle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, now it's, now it's predicated on an empirical mistake, right? Like he just thought, by observation that hey, the celestial uh, I have to I have to take this call real quick. I'm sorry. Take it. I'm I'll I'll keep chatting while you do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Um so the point I'm making, and Dr. Jim can get back on here, is that somebody can have have a, uh, a system in place that is generally awesome and correct, and sort of downstream from that system, uh, they might just not uh, apply all their principles consistently, that they could make a mistake, a metaphysical mistake or a moral mistake or something like that. That was a very fast call. Yeah, I just, uh, um, Jen's on the road today and uh, someone called her about a pickup for our kids and then she had to call me from the road. So it's all straight. Right, so you see you see the parallel I'm trying to show, right? It's like, we can say like, hey, Aristotle's project here, metaphysically, ethically is awesome. But as he kind of like goes downstream, we might've think that he just, might have went in the wrong direction on a certain yeah. particular yeah. thing right or there's there's facts that are available to us now that were not available to him right that right? the celestial like, bodies do undergo a substantial change yeah yeah exactly you know or, or just literally it literally it could be technological like like we've got telescopes that show us right. chunks of these things falling off and stuff like that you know and i say? don't think it's contrived to say that if aristotle or aquinas had that technology that they would have like adamantly stuck with the position that they did at their time i'm, I'm pretty confident that they yeah. would have been like nope my system's still right but i'm just going to change yeah. this particular now, aspect there, of it right <laughs> there is there is an uncomfortable question though in this in this vicinity for the for the aristotelian right um, cause some of this stuff, Aristotle claims now he does not claim that about anything ethical. Like, remember, like you don't get episteme level demonstrations in ethics for Aristotle. So that's all a moving yep. target. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go to like the cosmological stuff, he does claim some of that stuff is, is in my understanding is demonstrable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like it follows, you know, like as part of science. Okay. And then like how much you're going to, like it follows by deduction from first principles, how much you have to revise back to first principles could become an uncomfortable question. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but but once again, that does it like once again, you might have to alter. I mean, this is kind of like 
a generally Hegelian view of thinking these things, you might have to like alter first principles on the fly, right? Mm -hmm. um, as the world pushes back in new ways against the system, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean the system gets chucked out, right? So, yeah, yeah. You know, I, so I think we're all in some sense reformed Aristotelians if we're going to take Aristotle seriously now, yeah. Right, and the other thing I would say about more after the sort of elements and celestial sphere thing is, is going back to Aristotle is charitably, he's not, at least in that context, I don't think he's thinking of matter as much as the principle of individualization or particularization as it is a principle of moving things. Yep, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, there's a there's an equivocation of what's meant by matter. So exactly. once yeah. that's cleared up, I think we could that does a lot of it alleviates a lot, a lot of tension. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. Exactly. Save but that no, but, for another but, conversation. But I, yeah. No, but this is important for even reading the ethics. Is like I think mm -hmm. we all have to understand. Uh, and this is look. Okay, I think there are there are certainly a lot of Thomists who disagree on this sort of thing. Is like this. Aristotle's book is uh, is going to require revision, right? Okay, like our our British, somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah, it's somewhere. Okay, there are things in here, things we know about biology now. There's things we know about about psychology now. There's things that there's theological information that, that we have now. All of that is is going to like mean that that we don't we are going to be in a dialectical relationship with this book. Right? Yes, as we should like every book. Correct. Right? Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and once again, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not pointing to anything specifically wrong about the discussion of the minor virtues in in book four. My point is merely to say, like, look, what what we're looking for in reading the Nicomachean Ethics is not the minutia, right? It's the general structure of how yes. ethics should work. Yeah. yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. Okay. Book five. Then let's I, get into it. That's why when I teach ethics, I don't spend a lot of time in book four. Right? Yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that's overly ad hoc. Uh, it's certainly yeah. compatible with pedagogical laziness, but I think yeah. that's a fine explanation. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, the knower being not well known to himself, one wonders what the real motive is. So mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Indeed. So it's always, it's always there, isn't it? All right. So, okay, to, so to, the, to book five, just book five. Yeah. So now we're back to uh, a discussion of one of the cardinal virtues. Okay. Um, and in it's, it's book five, justice. Okay. Now, um, if you go to chapter one, book five, and, and don't worry, I'm not going to turn it into a read aloud or anything like that. Uh, Aristotle does not make for good TV when read aloud, right? So I think that's just, I think that's true, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, I've thought I've actually thought about that because uh, when when uh, the problem of Jim Hiddenness was going on, I just did a few short episodes just reading stuff, and it, it, I I thought like maybe we could read a little Aristotle, and then. In, almost immediately, I was like, no, no, it just, just, just doesn't work with <laughs> it doesn't Aristotle. Work. It just... doesn't work, man. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it, I mean, and remember, the guy did write dialogues. So, like, he, he didn't intend this to be read aloud. <laughs> right. Okay. But anyway, so we begin in, in, in chapter one of book five with kind of classic Aristotelian method, right? He lays out what do they say justice is? Okay. What do they say justice is? And we get we get some option, and once again, like what do you all what he'll always do he'll, when asked which of these is right, which of these is wrong, he'll say yes. Like the whole package, there's something very right about it, right? But also, there's like he thinks there's there, we're going to need a greater clarity about it. Okay, so mm -hmm. what we get in book in chapter one is he says, you know, well, he gives you like and once again a a, a great piece of Aristotelian method. He says, well, a lot of times we only know what something is by by looking at its contrary okay and clearly like when we we all suffer by someone's greed right we have some sense of what the contrary of greed is right mm -hmm. and that would be a kind of justice right uh when we suffer from someone's lawlessness right we have a we know what we mean there which means we, implicitly we know what lawfulness is and that's a kind of justice okay um so he, you know he basically says well part of what we mean by justice is the you know antithesis of greed which would be a kind of fairness all right mm -hmm. but he then says but that can't be the whole story because um there's kinds of injustice that don't aren't just taking more than you deserve he sees like what a greedy person does is they're going to grab more than they deserve they're going to take more than they deserve okay because he says there's also a kind of justice where you don't take enough of the bad right it's sort of like you know if we're all on a team right like maybe I don't take more of the glory than I deserve as a member of the team, but I also don't do as much of the work of the, yeah, the hard stuff. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So it's, so he says like justice isn't always taking more. Sometimes it's taking less. Mm -hmm. If you take greed to mean taking more, well then it doesn't quite fit. That's not exactly. So fairness in terms of the, the antithesis of greed or the contrary of greed doesn't fully capture justice is it's a, it's a mode of justice. It's not the whole thing. Right? Yes. 
And he says, sometimes what we mean by justice is someone, you know, is who isn't lawless, right? Okay. And someone who follows the laws of the city, they would be a just person. He says, that's yeah, true. Okay. But he also thinks that there's, there's something deeper to it because someone could like follow the laws of the city, which sort of makes sense because, you know, the laws of the city should be ordered toward justice in some sense, but not really be just, right? They could be accidentally following the laws or something like that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he brings up in that first chapter, I think it's fascinating giving discussions we had about Plato. Okay. He says that like sometimes what we mean by justice is someone who is complete in virtue, who's got all the virtues running together all at once and they're right. harmonized. Okay. Which is exactly what Plato means by justice. It's the meta virtue for Plato. It's the meta virtue. Yeah. And so he brings up, he brings up that notion of sometimes what people mean by justice is the meta virtue, the virtue of virtues. Right. And, and so it's interesting. And, and clearly I, I have to think he has Plato in mind here because that's clearly mm -hmm. what in the Republic, what Plato means by justice. Okay. And he says, of course, that's justice. That's great. But that's not what we're looking for here because I'm looking for justice as one of the four cardinals, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like a, not meta, not meta virtue, but first order virtue. Right? So this, okay. yeah, this is, I, this is important, right? Because yeah. you don't want to run different streams of thought together. And yes. Aristotle is often associated, of course, with the wider natural law tradition. But if you read Aristotle, you never find natural law in him, yeah. right? Yeah. You find sort of natural justice. Yeah, that's going to come up in this, in this book. Versus, yeah. versus, but you never really find natural law. And at the same time, when Aristotle's talking about justice, it does seem to be a different mode of thought, as he's as you and, and are articulating, than how Plato thought of justice as yeah. sort of the, 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 the commanding virtue or the meta virtue, right? When yeah. things are all well organized. So yeah. there's, I guess there's something of a transition maybe we could think of between Plato and the, the upcoming actual natural law tradition. Yeah. Exactly. In Aristotle. You think that's yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, and that, and that probably goes above my historical pay grade, but I was moved in just reviewing uh, book five uh, you know, this morning that you do get later on in the book, a distinction between, um, was it, I think he calls it political justice versus natural justice. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this, this dovetails with things we talked about earlier. So there's going to be a note and this comes after where he talks about justice and exchange, right? Yeah. Which there he means just literally like what counts for playing just, fair financially. Yeah, just communicative right? justice. Yeah, right. Okay. Like playing fair financially in your city. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much admits that, that that's gonna vary from city to city, right? Like the price of a chicken is, you know, uh, you know, the price of a cow is sixteen chickens, that's gonna be relative to like the all sorts of economic concerns. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And he talks about political justice, which is once again gonna in many ways be relative to the city that you're in, okay. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he, he says like justice is not just lawfulness, right? Because lawfulness is going to vary from city to city and a city could go wrong too. It could be a bad city. And right? this, that's the yeah. key really. That's sort of, I think what binds all natural law thinkers together. Yeah. Right. That is the distinction that the city it, could go wrong. Is the city could go wrong. Right. Is yeah. that it, it's there. It's not positivism, right? It's not right. just what's posited. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because yeah. what's posited can go wrong. If you think that what's posited can go wrong, then I would say that almost inevitably puts you in the big 10 of natural law. Right? Exactly. exactly. Now, all yeah, the, the details the of that yeah. vary yeah. significantly yeah. from let's Locke, go on the details from right? Locke yeah. to the Stoics. But they all share, yeah. I think, at least that much in common. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so if you can see like, the way the structure goes, is like, he, he'll talk about justice and exchange, which is basically, you know, plain, fair in financial matters and that's going to be rather relative okay and yeah. then political justice would be rather, rather relative and then he does towards the end of this book introduce them but there's also natural justice there's stuff that's just flat out unjust and that seems to be transcultural for him right yes. or there's a hint that he never he never comes out and says it and i think partly because like just thinking like, you know, this is my armchair, you know, unjustified anthropology hermeneutics of the day. Give it is to it, us. Give it to yeah, us. Yeah. I mean, like the, the, the question of like trans cultural standards does, does, does not occur to Aristotle. Like he's, he's telling these people how to run Athens. Right. And so it's really important to them is political justice and, you know, and justice in exchange. Right. Cause he's prepping them to go run Athens. So it's like, okay, Hey guys, we got to ab abide by our standards, right. <laughs> but there's an implicit assumption that our standards are like naturally good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, but, context is so important. Aristotle is not, so important. not, not writing for us today. He's not writing for right. us. And moreover, and like, what's he doing this that we talked about this in the first episode is the Nicomian ethics yeah. is his course 
you know, to like prepare the young Athenian gentleman and really probably back in Macedonia, Alexander to go yeah, run the, the city for the politicians, right? For the politicians. Yeah. It's book. It's, it's, it's semester one of the two semester sequence of pre-political right. uh, intro to political science. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so what's he doing? He's like getting these people ready to go run Athens. So the important question is not, um, is there a trans cultural sense of justice now he's implicitly and maybe even explicitly here says yeah there is one okay but that but, but he doesn't go in any detail about it because that's not what he's up to that's not his aim mm -hmm. he's not his aim and, and the question i think for an ancient greek doesn't really even occur to them because like once again they you know they they do have you know the kind of like you know xenophobic racism of the ancient world like well why would we care what the barbarians do <laughs> right there's unwashed miscreants yeah like, yeah like like yeah well, i mean okay sure i'm sure there's unwashed miscreants that are running a foul and hopefully alexander will conquer them <laughs> right <laughs> wash them yeah you know i mean like you know they need a cage right and, and it, it, right i mean that's okay you know what i mean so the idea okay so so but coming up with a way to articulate that natural justice to them that doesn't occur to them because that's gonna be done at the point of a spear if at all right? yeah right mm -hmm. now when you get to rome this one's going to way over in historical pay grade here right you start getting people like cicero saying Oh no, there's got to be a natural law, right? Because mm -hmm. what is Rome trying to do? They're trying to do a kind of cultural synthesis now. Right? Yeah, right. Of all these disparate cultures, all these different standards of like justice in commerce and justice in 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 the law, right? Yeah. How the hell are we gonna like make this a coherent empire? It's only with empire that they, and of course Alexander's an empire, but they're doing it on the fly. Like, hey, but like now the Romans, they are trying to come up with a legal system for empire and you're going to have to justify that legal system unless you want perpetual war to all these different cultural contexts and therein becomes aha we better think out the natural law in some detail right yeah cicero yeah. would be good to visit at some point actually yeah and that's a blind spot on my part i think i've just exhausted what i know of cicero right there yeah with uh <laughs> without you on the podcast we've been spending more time with the stoics and yeah. again for natural law stoics are really important on this stuff like yeah because it occurs to them because there is a political cultural need for it that i right. don't think that was felt in um in the ancient greeks right sure yeah or at least right. it's not aristotle's primary intent with it's, what yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. it's not the primary intent okay yeah so yeah don't like, like don't expect the wrong things from this is kind of what yeah exactly saying, right? exactly yeah um okay rectificate um, rectific okay let so me, let me let me say rectificatory justice that's one of the yeah. hardest words yeah so <laughs> say rectifying so, justice i'm going yeah, to say that, yeah and so let, let me rewind this a little bit then okay so yeah. What we get is in the first book, the first chapter is, okay, what do, what do they say about justice? And like, we, this is standard Aristotle's move. And they're all, yeah, they all have good things to say, but it's not quite what we're getting at here. Okay. And he says he really likes um, this notion of justice as the overall virtue. Okay. Cause you know, he learned it from the old man. Right. Um, but he says, but what we're looking for is not that, we're, we're not, not general justice, but he calls it special justice. Okay. And I think that's the meta versus first order view here right yeah. so not justice overall but justice as a particular virtue okay mm -hmm. and then then he goes into discussing that okay and we get this distinction at that point well, well we get a long discussion there but then towards the end of that at the end of of chapter two mm -hmm. we get this distinction between what we call today distributive justice okay as opposed to rectificatory justice or we can do just, it Re rectificatory justice yeah. or let's just do it with the, oh, wait, rectifying, other people, rectifying rectifying justice, rectifying, rectifying yeah. justice. that's yeah. it for now okay. it's one of the and sometimes it's called retributive justice which i think is is, right. is important too mm -hmm. okay so and so he says so you now you're gonna have like you're gonna have all other sorts of justices going on here but they're all gonna like i think the focal meaning for him will be justice in distribution okay and so what is justice in distribution it is the giving of people goods that they deserve. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Like equality is a big thing for Aristotle, but not in the way that modern egalitarians yeah. want to. Okay. Do. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to bring this up here. Okay. So, and then what is, what is justice, erectifying justice? It is giving people bads that they deserve. Okay. All right, this is my simplified way of putting it. Okay. So, it's, it's, they're both distributive in a way, but the question of like, what are we distributing here? Okay. Yeah. One is the distribution of goods, the other is the distribution of bads. Okay. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it's pretty clear, once again, like he still he has a thought, this is always thought of in terms of a political context for Aristotle. Because remember, man is the political animal, right? We are the political animal. Okay. And so what he means by distribution of goods here is distribution of stuff from the common city purse. 
Yes. Okay. Who gets what from the common? All right. At this point. And so he's really talking about the distribution of, okay, certainly like salaries, okay, from the common, but also honors. It's really mostly about honors. Like, mm -hmm. who do we honor? Who do we give the goods of honor? Who do we give the titles to? Okay. Right. And and then he goes in to say, okay, in in the um the, the what we have to sort out here is among, I believe he says it's four terms. Okay. You've got two people, right? And then two allotments that have to be given. Do you see that? And the principle is two equal people go equal allotments of good. All right. But note, it does not presume equality among the people. Right. Okay. And this is, this is where it is. This, 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 it's a little uncomfortable for us. Right. Okay. This is why we got to cancel Aristotle. <laughs> He's got to go. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, he says the two, two equals go equals. So, so if two people are equal, they should get equal honor. Right. If two people are equal in terms of their their talents and abilities, they should get equal allotment from the co common purse. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. But no, it's always proportionate. The proportion here is not it's it's it's, I guess, two way. It's a proportion of the good to the person and the persons to the persons. Right. Like mm -hmm. I it is not unjust for Pat to get more than Jim if Pat is just better than Jim. Right. Okay, and it's not. Do, do you see the point there, right? Yes. Uh, and because remember, the primary thing you see here is honors, right? Mm -hmm. It's not wrong for us to like recognize Pat and say Pat is great. Uh, to you know, on a ten out of ten scale, and Jim is great on a seven out of ten scale. I'll take the C, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, if indeed Pat is a ten out of ten and Jim is a seven out of ten, okay, that's justice in distribution for Aristotle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. right. And I mean, look, I mean, this is sort of a very common intuition. Think of Michael Jordan, right? Yeah, exactly. We exactly. think that, right. I mean, just think of any sort of competition and honor any that goes into that, yeah, right? And exactly. this, is, this is the sort of cultural hesit hesitancy to give everyone a participation trophy. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, it, it, and, it, and, it, and, and, and Aristotle is really just kind of expressing the general Greek view of things like, yeah. you know, okay. Okay. And now, now let's, I want to, now, now look, now at the same time, right? Um, it, I think it is important to say, like, it's it, probably for the Greeks, it wasn't that mild, right? No, no, it was. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that mild, right? Because um, because yeah, there's yeah, yeah there are was, natural slaves. In their yes, yeah. so that's what I'm saying. Like, we don't want to like make this seem more tamer than it actually yeah. is. It's actually yeah. more provocative, exactly. Than I think a lot that. of us would want to accept. But there's a general idea there that I think is not well, not only acceptable and right. If they took it too far, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that, and that, I think that's an important, very, very important point, right? Is um, we're not just talking about like who gets particip participation trophy here. We're also talking about like who gets recognized as a citizen, right? Yeah. Do you see what you know I mean? And now, no, in the Greeks, there is no sense that everybody's on par there. That's right. Just in and virtue that's of what, showing up yeah. as human. Yeah. That's and that's something where I think certainly from a Christian perspective, we're gonna say, okay, that was a mistake, right? Yeah. Or, or um, not, I wouldn't even say a mistake. There's information now that we have that Aristotle didn't have. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Because like, mm -hmm. it, I mean, I, I do think if you look, if you're looking at this, if you look at like the distribution of talents mm -hmm. among human beings, right, and you have no you have not been informed. God, God did not Greek. endow intelligence evenly. That is, evenly, that is, yeah, a, that is exactly, a certainty. Exactly, yeah. right. Okay, do you see me? And you're not informed by the Christian tradition, right? Yeah. Okay, or I'm, I, I think there's other religious traditions that are going to do the same thing for you, okay? Uh, but if you're not informed by some religious tradition, um, and you're just looking at, hey, what's the natural distribution of talents among human beings? Well, you get hierarchy, right? You get yeah. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not coming out for that. I'm just saying without some kind of some some datum right yeah over and above just, just the distribution just, of human talents yeah you're just saying it's quite understandable why they would have come to this position right yes certainly yes. certainly okay. certainly right. right yeah good yeah uh, so just yeah i just want to be fair like it's not as it, it's not a exactly tame understanding no, of, it is of, not. In, of it is inequality because i think there and, is yeah there, there yeah. are tame understanding of inequality like okay so like there's some sort of minimum threshold by which we are all equal imago day so there's like in yeah. some sense like we're all deserving of this level of dignity and respect and care or this or that 
uh, whatever that floor is, we're saying the Greeks did not have that, right? Doesn't seem, or it it was not recognizably the same as ours, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And when we eventually we do the politics, we talk about natural slaves in there. There's 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 nuance to it there too. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. But but I think we have to realize that this is this is a very hierarchical view of the world, not just in terms of like like. Like once again, we have a we have a sanitized view of it. Well, you know, there's there's the hierarchy of being, and you know, and and it and it's really just about you know the physical versus non physical. Well, that like the macrocosm matches the microcosm for these guys, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And the city is going to be structured like the universe. So if you've got like a top in the city in the in the universe, going down to like less and less and less less dignified aspects of the world metaphysically, mm -hmm. guess what? In the city, you're going to have top. And then going down to less dignified aspects of the city, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And but now, now let's talk about justice in uh, rectifying justice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here, it's not a question of like what you get from the commons. It's like what you're given in terms of punishment for failing to be just. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like 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 he mentions like a list of things that, that require rectifying justice. Things like, you know, theft, murder, adultery, cheating, you know, you know, uh, you know, not fulfilling a contract, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Right. Yeah. Economic injustices yeah. of various sorts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so here though it's interesting. Like the terms of proportionality are not person to person. All right. It's just offense to uh to the punishment mm -hmm. okay so he actually says in terms of rectifying justice all humans are equal okay um and it and the, we only are going to proportion the punishment to what was done okay so to the offense yeah yeah so if the gentleman murders someone or the slave murders someone they should get the same punishment. same punishment same right. punishment yeah Okay. It doesn't matter. It's it, it's indifferent right, mm -hmm. to who you are, right? If if the the gentleman cheats on his wife, right, or or cheats, they would only be worried about cheating with someone else's wife. Okay, mm -hmm. but the slave cheats with someone else's wife. Um, that is uh, equally deserving of punishment for both of them. It's the same thing. The punishment yeah. fits the crime, not the person. That's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The honor, right? The award fits. The person, the person. Okay. the punishment fits, fits the, the crime. Crime, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's interesting. Like, like if, if you think of it, um, for Aristotle and distribu distributive justice, we would not like he would be opposed to something like Rawls' veil of ignorance, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't like it matters who you are outside the veil of ignorance in terms of what you get. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. but in terms of uh, just rectifying justice, he's all for the veil of ignorance. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter who you are outside the veil of ignorance. All that matters is the crime. It, it, right. Just what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you do, right? And can you? So I think there's maybe. I mean, this this is not what I work on, but I think there's maybe a root here, right? Coming toward our no notion of justice, right? That is much more indifferent to who you are, right? Uh, it's already here because at least in rectifying justice, it is indifferent to the character of the individual or the station yeah. of the individual, right? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe you could even see the beginnings of a of a justice that's indifferent. That's right. a good point. In mm -hmm. an important sense of it, a good sense of indifferent already here in book five. Right. right? The seeds, the seeds are the here. Seeds are, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, the dialectical seeds are planted, right. And starting to work through. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's yeah. a good highlight. Okay. Very good. What else do we want to summarize no, about I mean, book five? Mm -hmm. Could we kind of, cause we did the back part of it up front. When we talked about the relationship between um, political justice and justice in exchange and then natural justice. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's pretty much the book. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Awesome. Well, good to be back with Aristotle. It is homework, good to be back, man. Homework for next time is to read book six, right? Let's do book six. And I think we're going intellectual virtue there. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a my first paper I ever published was on Aristotle and intellectual virtue. What was the title of it? Gosh, what was the title of that paper? It was or is um I don't even remember. I have to look it we up. Should, we should do an episode where we go. Uh, I would love to do it. We would just take one of your old early papers yeah. and just uh, see, like, does Jim still hold this view? Does he yeah. think differently? It would be fun. There's there's some stuff I publish I definitely don't hold now. This one I might actually still hold. I, I did this whole thing. It was on – it was it's actually on, like, like uh, teleology and, um, like, reformed epistemology and intellectual virtue. Oh, that would be a cool one yeah, to do. Yeah, I'll send you a copy of it. Maybe we can. Yeah, let's do it. Let's yeah. dig it up and, and go through it. That yeah. would be sweet. 
Yeah, it would be good for me to look at that again before we go to do this chapter of Nick Mean Ethics. Cool. I, 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 nor I normally don't do this chapter of the Nick Mean Ethics, right? Mm -hmm. um, in when teaching because it, it gets us in all this like ep epistemic and philosophy of mind stuff, which is a distraction from the class that I'm teaching in ethics, right? right? But a lot of people think like this 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 chap this next book uh, six is maybe like this like one of the centerpieces of the whole deal. Like like you learn a lot about Aristotle's views of things in general, right? Yes. From this um, and like the phenomenological phenomenological tradition like really takes off from this in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, it's interesting stuff in there. So I don't think we should skip that, even though it's not. How it fits in the central argument of the book is an interesting question. All right. All right. Well, next time, gentle listeners, please like, share, subscribe, and we'll catch you then. Peace.